and good morning to everyone. Here we are at Mount Zion Baptist Church, we're in the sanctuary, and I'm going to bring you a short message this morning. I never thought or dreamed that we would be doing this again. Uh, when Brother Ray Williams was here during the revival, we both uh, said that uh, we would never do this again. We would never preach to an empty church. So I'm trusting that somebody will be listening to this after a while. I'll be posting this on Facebook and on uh, YouTube, and you can listen to it later. It just shows one thing for sure, that Satan is powerful. All during our revival, I think Satan took jabs at us. He did things to upset, to uh, try to waylay the revival, but we stuck in, we held in, and, and we had a great revival. And now we can see how powerful Satan really is, though. He is trying to destroy the church again. And I'm praying, church family, that we do not ever allow Satan to take control of our church. That we defeat him, not him defeating us. <clears throat> this morning I will read from Acts chapter 1. It said, The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, <coughs> all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs being seen of them forty days, speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith, Be ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times of the season, which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the world. And when he had spoken these words, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Let us pray over these words this morning. Thank you, Lord, for this day, and thank you, Lord, for the beautiful day that we have outside. Lord, we're suffering right now because our church family has developed this COVID disease. We're asking you, Lord, to heal each and every individual. Let it not be uh, worse than it really is. Bless us this morning, Lord, and uh, maybe those that out there uh, will hear this message this morning and know that you're still in control of everything, that you are the one who sees and, and sees things happen. And you will direct what happens in, in America today. We're asking you, Lord, to forgive us of our sins this day. For our sins are many, and we need your protection and your help in everything that we do. Bless this church and bless our church family. All these things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. I have a short message on title, Lest We Forget. If you remember back in year 2001 and I never thought about it while we was going through the revival but uh, one of those days was 9-11 and everybody remembers back in 2001 it left us with a simple and profound commitment and that commitment was to never forget never forget and you know memory is a wonderful tool for improving ourselves it's a blessing from our creator by using it, we can learn to grow, to avoid past errors, and duplicate our past successes. Satan will try to warp our memories and tries to embed fear, bitterness, resentment, anger, and hatred in our hearts over past events and the sins that we've committed. 
So we need to guard against using mem memories in a sinful manner. Memory helps us to treasure what is good and refine ourselves. It also teaches us to repent and to turn to return to the Lord. I have heard it said, some people have said, I am so forgetful that I can even go out and hide my own Easter eggs and hunt them. So if that's you this morning, I assure you all of us suffer from, from memory problems at times. I know this, that Alzheimer's is one of the most horrible diseases that can happen in America today. Because you lose all memories, all memories of what you did in the past and who you are and the things that you do. Uh, my mother-in-law suffered from it. It was a pitiful thing to see. Sometimes though, that there, you and I suffer from what I call spiritual Alzheimer's. We sometimes forget what the Lord has done for us. We sometimes forget who's in control of this world. When I look at the situation that we're in this morning with the COVID and uh, Dora and I both uh, had COVID this last week. And uh, that shows me that, uh, all right, that tells me that, that Satan can, can attack you, but only the Lord can tell you what's going to happen to you. Also, I'm talking about memory, though. We all have memories of things in the past that were so beautiful. I assure you, the people that come to church here have memories of when the church house was full of people or when it was full of kids or, or when it was a, a joyous time here at the church. We have good memories, don't we? Or we remember, uh, I, I like to say, about the good old days. And I do remember the good old days. It was a long time ago. I remember when gasoline was 25 cents a gallon. I remember those things. When a loaf of bread was 19 cents. Nothing like that anymore, is there? But our relationship with Jesus Christ, this morning I want you to understand, is a present day reality. It's not about the past. It is about right now. Who you are right at this very moment. It informs you every day to make the correct decision. That's why we come to worship together. That's why we, that should be the main motivating factor when you get out of bed in the morning is what am I going to do for the Lord today? Yes, we got heaven to look forward to. The psalm tells us, as in the sweet by and by. And boy, I'm looking forward to that sweet by and by. But I can tell you this, our walk with Jesus is in the, in the present, now and now. It is right now. You are to be walking with Jesus. This morning, as I read that Acts 9, chapter 1, the scripture from there, there was a commentator that I ran across that said, this is considered the great days of expectation. Jesus, we know, had completed his earthly ministry. He'd gone to the cross. He went into the tomb. He rose from the grave. He appeared unto his disciples and to hundreds of other people. He had given the great commission to all of his disciples and now was about to ascend back into heaven where he would take his place at the right hand of the Father and then wait for his Father to look at him and say, Son, go bring your children home. Those things we need to remember. Lest we forget, it is all about Jesus Christ. I know if you're like me, you can feel the expectations, the anticipation of the kingdom of God. We're all looking forward to it one day. He, he had taught his disciples about this kingdom. Jesus had promised that he would send the Holy Spirit. And that's what happened here in these verses this morning. He is going to send the Holy Spirit and the angel promised something that each and every one of us should be looking for as we rise from our bed each and every day. And that is that he is coming again. Lest we forget. Forget what? 
First of all, we need to, three things I want to point out this morning. Things that you forget. First of all, who your Savior is. And then why he saved you. The second thing you need to remember is where lost people go when they die. And then finally, you need to remember who you're living for this day. So who your Savior is and why he saved you. I can tell you right off the top, it is not because you're such a good person and it is not because uh, God was lucky to get you. I can tell you that right off the top. If you've given your life to Jesus, then your Savior is risen. A living Jesus Christ that is the Savior of the world. He is alive today and he should be alive in your heart today. 1 John 4, 14 says, And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. We find in the Old Testament, we're going to find examples of saviors. Joshua of the old was a savior. Gideon was a savior. David was a savior. But the title is given to our Lord above all other titles because he is a savior in the sense that he did something that none of these other people could do. None of these other great men of the Bible could do. He saved his people from their sins. And here's some of the things that we need to remember about our Savior. First of all, he had a, an amazing earthly ministry. If you look at verse 1 there, it tells you that it was an amazing ministry. In verse 2, it talks about he gave us commands while he was here. So many times we ignore or we disobey those commands that Jesus Christ has given us. One is the forsaking of our assembly and ourselves in, in God's house. We don't do that on, as regular as we should anymore. Verse 3 says, tells us that Jesus Christ is alive and he's still alive today. He is sent in verses 4 and 5. It tells us that Jesus sent the Holy Spirit that he could give us comfort, he could give us guidance while Jesus is at the Father's right hand. Also, it tells us, these verses tell us that he came to seek and to save those that were lost. Luke 19, 10, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. That is why he saved you. He came to seek he came to save you, lest you forget. That's what Jesus Christ came to earth for. We seem to forget. We get wrapped up in the fact that he went to the cross and that uh, he died on the cross and all of the things involved in it. He came to do that. He came to die for us. I ask you a question this morning. You were lost. But now you're found. Is that not correct? Were you dead? But now you're alive. Were you an enemy of God? But now you are a friend of God. Were you the object of God's wrath? Was he going to destroy you? But now you are the object of his mercy. That means that if you've never given your life to him, he's still seeking you. He still wants to save you this very day. Lest we forget, and I stress this, lest you forget, he can and will do it right now. So if you hear this message this morning, either on Facebook or you hear it on, uh, uh, you go to our website or you go to YouTube and you find this message, I want you to stress it. I want to stress this. He still can save and he still will save right now. You can look on our website. You can find a, 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 the message of salvation there. How it is, how easy it is to be saved. The ABCs of salvation are there on our website. 
So Jesus' earthly ministry began with his work and his teaching. This first chapter that we call the, the great days of expectation. Jesus' earthly ministry was launched. And these great days, the great days of expectation that the world has ever seen. We, we, we anticipate the greatest things that ever happened. And his ministry started there and it continues today as he continues to seek and to save that which is lost. Why is this so important today? Never forget, unless we forget where lost people go when they die. These next few words are not going to be very pleasant, but they're true. You're going to see from these words why it is very important for us to witness to those people who are lost. Some time ago, I watched a scene on a newscast at a big warehouse fire. And these people, the firefighters were out there and they were fighting fire. They had the big trucks and they had they were spraying water on the building and it was you could tell the fire was inside of the building and anyway they put ladders up to the side of the building they were going to go up i guess to the roof and chop holes so they could put water down through but as the men were climbed up on the roof all of a sudden you could see explosions start inside of the building boom boom and it was going off and then and all of a sudden there a blast and uh, fire came through the roof of the building. And the men scurried down those ladders trying to get away. And the fire was all around them. And they were coming down the building. And they were spraying water on them and trying to keep them cool. And, and luckily, each and every one of the firefighters got down off of the uh, roof. But some of them, and none of them died, but some of them got injured quite severely. In fact, the burns, fire is dangerous. In fact, fire burns. Burns, and if you've ever had a burn, you know that's one of the most painful injuries that you can get, is a burn. The scriptures talk about the horrors of fires and the fires of hell. And remember this, those who reject Christ will endure fire for eternity. If you read your Bible, you're going to find that Jesus talked a lot about hell. In fact, Jesus talked about hell more than any other person in the whole Bible. In Luke 16, he describes a great chasm over which that we cannot go. It's a place where if you go, you cannot come back because there's a great gulf. It says, and beside all of this, between us and you, there is a great gulf. So once you go there, you cannot return. In Matthew 25, Jesus tells of the time when people will be separated into two groups. One entering into his presence, the other banished to eternal fire. In fact, in verse 31 in Matthew 25, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, and as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. But then you go down to the 41st verse of Matthew 25. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. You see, God did not want anybody to go to hell. He prepared that place for the devil and his angels. If you go to hell today, it's because... 
you have rejected the plan that will keep you out of that awful place called hell. God does not send you there, but he will allow you to go. In fact, Jesus allows us to do whatever we want today. Then we have to suffer the consequences. I want you to understand, Jesus doesn't only reference hell a lot. He describes it in great detail. In Luke 20, 16, 23, he says it's a place of eternal torment. In Mark 9, 43, he says it's a place of unquenchable fire. In other words, it never dies out. It never goes out. In Mark 9, 48, it's where the worm will never die. It's like having a disease that can never be cured. In Matthew 13, 42, it says where people will gnash their teeth in anguish and regret. In Luke 16, 19 through 31, and from which there is no return. And what is even said, you cannot warn your loved ones from there of this awful place. He calls it a place of outer darkness in Matthew 25, 30. He compares it to Gehenna in Matthew 10, 28. Gehenna was a trash dump outside the walls of Jerusalem where rubbish was burned and it smoked and stunk all the time where you could find maggots running around in the food that was left in the trash it was thrown out. Jesus talks about hell more than he actually talks about heaven. He describes it more vividly than he does heaven. So there's no denying that Jesus knew, believed, and warned against the absolute reality of hell. We must never forget that this is final. It's an eternal destination for those who are lost and die without Christ. That should stir up your heart this morning with an urgency to go out into the world and tell people about Jesus Christ. Tell people that they need to be saved. If we water down the message about the reality of hell, then we are sending people to hell. If we water it down, Excuse me. I speak to you from my heart this morning. Is this where you want your friends and your family members to go? To end up in this awful place called hell. So take command. Take the command of Jesus Christ when he said, go out into the world and tell the world about me. To be a witness to seriously share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't take it flippantly. Be serious about it. You can't make people accept Christ, but you have to do your part. You have to take the first step. You have to share. The final point this morning, lest who you forget or lest you forget who you're living for this day, I can tell you it's not yourself. There's a small, important two-letter word in verse 8. And if you look it out, you'll find that it talks about, it's the word my. Jesus said to his disciples, Ye shall be my witnesses. Okay? You shall be unto me or my witnesses. It was personal, intimate, special. He looked them in the eyes. Can you imagine them standing around him, facing him, listening for each word that comes out of his mouth? And he's given them this command that they were to give up their own lives for him. And they were to do it for the sake of the gospel, to spread the good news of Jesus Christ.
He'd already told them in Luke 9, 23, and he said it to them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. We know what the cross is. The cross is a symbol of death. There's nothing beautiful about it. It's an ugly instrument of death that the Romans used to kill uh, prisoners with. Not only to kill them, but to torture them. And now he tells them to be his witness, to be martyrs, those who are willing to give up their lives for him. And if they did, they would never forget for the rest of their lives who they were living for. They were living for Jesus. This Jesus, as the angels talked to him in verse 11, you and I are living for this same Jesus. That changes everything for us. He changes everything. So many people in the world are living for themselves. All you'll get is emptiness, hopelessness. It's a dead-end street if all you think about is yourself. All you say, what? It feels okay. I'm all right. It, it feels good. But in the end, it will lead to a place called hell. Now, I know people don't like to hear that word anymore. They don't like to hear people, preachers, preach about hell. But Jesus thought it's important, and we should too. One of the ways that you know that you're going to belong to Jesus Christ is if there's a change in your life. Do you walk different now? Do you talk different now? Do you live your life different than you did before? In closing this morning, I ask you, ask yourself this question. Who am I truly living for? Is it for myself or is it for Jesus Christ? If it's for anyone other than the Lord Jesus, you need to examine your heart to see if you truly belong to him. Thank you this morning. That's the message that I have in my heart. I want each and every one of you to know that I'm praying for us and I'm praying for our church that we'll get through this awful thing called COVID-19. But lest we forget, Satan is very powerful. And we need to keep our eyes focused on Jesus Christ. If we're going to get through this, we need to be praying each and every day that the Lord take control of it and take this thing away from us this day. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for the day. Thank you, Lord, for this message. Let it not return void. If anyone hears or sees this message today, I ask you, Lord, to prick their hearts, pour your spirit out on them, that they may become convicted and seek Jesus Christ before they go to this awful place called hell. Lift this church up in the days ahead. Let us be a beacon in Spring City that people can see that people are coming here for salvation. Bless us each and every day and forgive us for our sins. It's in Christ's name that I see things. Amen.